Vardzia and Val Royal. The former is a monastery cut into the caves of the Lower Caucasus mountain range in southern Georgia. The latter is the seat of the Chantry in Dragon Age Inquisition. Both sites of power, both sites that we might think of as being connected to a medieval setting or time frame, both seats of identity and of faith. But what might we find on the road between Vardzia and Val Royal? That is the topic that I want to talk to you about today. Computer games understandably tend to speak to modern concerns and use modern models of power. This is perfectly normal. This is a standard feature of how art works. We speak to the concerns of the time and place and people that we live in and live around. However, there is a, a difference and that we can draw between the common and the inevitable. And one of the issues of putting modern power structures into our medieval settings is that we treat the medieval as a space distant from our own, a space prior to our own. And this can make some power structures and forms of oppression or identity from our present time appear inevitable and continual as we project them back into our imagined pasts. And by placing modern forms of horror or bigotry into the past, it can sometimes absolve our modern audiences of feelings of responsibility for them by putting them further back from the present, by saying, well, this was always here, this was always like this. And it reduces the range of stories that, uh, as game designers, we can tell by reducing the range of cultures and social structures that players can navigate. One of the traditions in thinking about computer games historically is this idea of accuracy. Um, so I'm going to start by knocking that over for you. Um, historical games inevitably cannot be accurate in every aspect. Uh, nobody wants to play a game where you are Geralt of Rivia, but you do have to go to the toilet every hour or two of gameplay. Um, that's over 100 hours of game. It would get dull. Um, and also accuracy in one area can be used by some game developers as a shield against critiques of another. For example, your Kingdom Come Deliverance, where the swords and the buildings look fantastically, quote unquote, accurate to late medieval Bohemia, but the social history may have significant deviations based on the developer's very strong Czech nationalist leanings. Um, and this has caused some moves to, for example, an authenticity-based approach on what people feel about the past in games. But today I want to instead offer a frame of games as a process of curation. What gets taken from the past and put into a game? And why is that process happening? What do we pick? And just as importantly, what do we leave behind in the medieval past? And it's on that note that I'm going to tell you about something that is frequently in the left behind box. Welcome to the High Medieval Caucasus um, and the culture from which the cave monastery of Vardzia aforementioned originated. Uh, so the Caucasus is this region that covers the modern countries of Georgia, Armenia and Azerbaijan, also parts of southern Russia, northeastern Turkey. Um, in the 12th century, it was dominated by the Georgian Bagrationid dynasty. Um, and they dominated this region, I'm not going to say ruled because it often wasn't direct, through this complex network of alliances and relationships with Armenian princes, the rulers of Shirvan in modern Azerbaijan, and other neighboring powers. They also, it's also seen in Georgia traditionally as a golden age, with rulers like David IV, Achemeshenebeli, the builder, it is a difficult word to pronounce, and maybe Tamar, the first female ruling monarch of Georgia. Um, it's a period of high literary culture for the region as well. But of course, a golden age is not golden for everybody. Um, there is a map of the 12th century region. In case it's of interest, we can pull back if anybody's interested in me ranting more about this in questions. Um, and this was a very highly diverse and urbanized region, uh, covering Georgians, Armenians, Persians, Turks, Kurds, Chipchaks from the North Caucasus, um, and these 
peoples interrelate in a variety of ways. It's also a diverse faith environment with Orthodox Christianity in Georgia, but the separate Gregorian or Armenian Christian tradition amongst the Armenians, uh, Muslims, Jews, the uh, pagan population of the Caucasus, and so on. Uh, it's a place of quite centralized court culture, but not necessarily administratively centralized. We, don't, we shouldn't think of this as having all the institutions and powers of a modern state. And we have this kind of semi-mobile court feature, which is actually surprisingly unusual to see in representations of the Middle Ages, but in many early and high medieval cultures, the personal presence of monarchs was important, and you dealt with that by moving the monarch around. It was displaying presence and maintaining their links mattered. The Caucasus is not a common feature in computer games. Uh, the exceptions to this tend to be in the world of strategy, your Crusader Kings 3, your medieval Total War, where you're doing a map and the Caucasus has to be on the map so you don't have a black hole. Um, where it is presented, um, for example, in, uh, I think it's Civilization 6, introduces the Georgians, they're often treated as just this sort of mountain culture. It's just a bunch of guys who sit up a mountain and live in fortresses or something. Um, but why should we therefore look at it if it's not something that game designers treat very much? Partly because of this, because it's an underused idea, because it might provide an alternative scope for what medieval can look like. And um, it might therefore produce new ideas for developers and a wider range of possibilities for players. Um, and I'm going to look at a couple of aspects of that now with you. Firstly, power and the state. State power in medieval settings in games is frequently assumed. Rulers can exercise a high level of direct control over people's labor and over military manpower and taxation. Look, for example, at Radovid in The Witcher 3, who manages to conquer about three countries within the space of two years and then turn around their armies into a single cohesive force against his own major enemies. This is something that would be frankly miraculous if it happens to any major ruler in history. Um, but again, it's showing this idea where Radovid is able to control a state apparatus to do that. And this creates a very absolutist dynamic for how power is shown. Rulers gain power in zero sum ways. They are trying to take power from anybody else who might have any, and anybody else who might want to retain power is trying to do it at the expense of their monarchs. This means that legitimacy politically can be reduced to questions of who's in charge, the succession, and material power. Do you have the people? Do you have the money to finance any of your ambitions? And threats become an all or nothing struggle. And this actually is quite similar to some traditional narratives about how the medieval Caucasus worked. But when we look closely, we find that actually medieval power actors often don't want to try and gain absolute power. Because if you are a medieval Jordan Eristavi, one of the ducal level rulers of a region, you are as high as you are going to get in the you know, power structure food chain of the time. You cannot become the monarch. And the thing you probably most want to do is enjoy that and avoid losing your power. So there is a very stability focused thing we actually find much more amongst medieval rulers. And what we find if we look at legitimacy in the medieval Caucasus is that it is an ongoing fluid issue. It's something rulers are continually trying to promote. If we go back to Vardzia, you can see today in the central church of that cave monastery, a larger than life height painting of Queen Tamar and her father, Georgi III. This is you know, political power writ as faith, large on a wall. And the reason for that continual promotion is that relationships between polities were not always this neat thing of either you're my ally and you're next to me and you're the same, or you're my vassal and you're completely under me and have to do everything I say. Legitimacy wasn't a zero-sum binary calculation. The extent of support that you could get from someone mattered. The point at which they might break with you mattered. But also day to day, how many troops are they actually going to send when I go to war? How effectively are they going to represent me to their own subordinates? And there was this need to hold legitimacy amongst the diverse groups that I've already mentioned. This isn't just a ruler who has to play to a single monoethnic constituency in the style that we might imagine for some nation states. 
Um, and so gaining legitimacy can be a counter absolutist thing. A strong ruler might be a ruler who can bring on side the Armenians and the Kipchaks and the Ossetians and gain respect and therefore gain recognition from those people. A weak ruler might be the one who has to centralize to try and gain power in this zero sum way. And therefore they can command less manpower. They risk fractures by leaning on that ethno and faith centric idea of what their polity can be. Um, and we can move on now to look at factions and connections. Who's on whose side and why? Some games, of course, do have factional models. We look at Mountain Blade, Crusader Kings 3, there's a bit of this in Skyrim, but they're usually treated as positions on a single major schism. Um, civil wars and unrest in practice actually tended to disrupt some of the networks you could see in peacetime. Families who were quite closely connected potentially in peacetime politics um, in the medieval Caucasus actually a civil war could suddenly, very suddenly force them onto different sides uh, for a variety of reasons. For example, it might be that um, because uh, the other major Georgio-Armenian family, other than you as a Georgio-Armenian noble, had picked one side in the civil war, you suddenly had an opportunity or even a responsibility to pick the other side because your wider community was going to need somebody in the role of connecting between the monarchy and the Armenians. Um, and so politics is often treated as this sort of sealed bubble um, with political factions as these closed networks. And that's not our historical experience at all. And that extends to connections across borders, where, for example, having connections to the Kip tracks on the step could actually be very important in letting you start getting involved in things like negotiating who members of the royal family were going to marry. So your lateral connections, not just your vertical ones within this state or political unit, could really matter. And so we can use, and so we can question some of these roles of this like clunky big medieval state and use that to get some wider options for how power is presented in games. By recentering storytelling on ongoing legitimacy, we could open the door to some different dynamics between rulers and battles, uh, build elite connectivity as something other than a single like numerical axis of who likes who, who doesn't like who. There are differing priorities and connections that can be forced out in different circumstances. And by building less hierarchical ideas of how people are connected up, we can make more complications in how power is presented and also how the oppression and freedom of different groups connects into those power structures. Um, and now I'll move on to that topic. Identity in RPGs, and particularly um, I'm talking ethnic identity that we'll touch on others, is often a location of distance and violence. Uh, if you look at, for example, the uh, Elves of Dragon Age, the Dwarves of the Witcher games, these are identities that are very strongly circumscribed as um, they are distant from the player, they are different to you, and they are people who are suffering violence against themselves. Um, and this is exacerbated by the way that fantasy medieval settings tend to speciate minority ethnicities. Um, you know, the, um, the dwarves um, and elves of um, the Witcher and Dragon Age that I just mentioned are very clearly presented as ghettoized pseudo Jewish communities. Um, and so, and it's extremely rare conversely to find a non-dominant ethnicity or culture that actually crosses multiple species in a role-playing game. Um, conversely, the majority identity is then tied to the polity. We get the proto-nation state. Um, and we get that logic replicated. You know, your Fereldons of Dragon Age are very much humans. And even in sort of fairly multi-species uh, settings like um, the Dungeons and Dragons setting of Faerun, the game set in that, all of the upper nobility of Baldur's Gate in Baldur's Gate or Neverwinter and Neverwinter Nights are humans. So there is quite, so there is this sort of strict majority polity identity connection going on there. Uh, and where there are fractures in that, it's usually that there is some clearly occupied proto-nation. So 
you know, the, the whole Skyrim for the Nords thing that goes on in Skyrim is this very clear, you know, there is this area, there is this native, if you like, population. Um, and um, the and so this is dealt with either with this distance and violence system or by reducing these issues in salience. So, for example, some settings just do a, it doesn't matter what um, species, ethnicity, or gender you are. Um, but of course, this then removes your ability to talk about those forms of oppression in the game if you are simply going to get around this by not representing them. Um, to return to the medieval Caucasus, we actually find that medieval Caucasian monarchs are monarchs of peoples, not places. Uh, the Georgian monarch is not the ruler of Georgia. They are the ruler of the Abkhazids, Khatvelians, Rans, Khakis. I'm not going to do the full list, partly because I can't remember it and partly because it's very long. Um, we also find that, like in real life, people have multiple layers of identity, local identities, regional identities, ethnic identities. Um, an example I use uh, when I'm teaching this in classes is to simply look at myself, where when I am in Austria, the salient feature that people tend to notice about me is that I'm English. Um, it's partly the accent, it's partly that I'm the only person here asking for milky black tea all the time. Um, the fact that I'm a European doesn't really make a much of a splash in Austria because the vast majority of people I meet here are also Europeans. But then if I go back to the UK, the fact that I am English is suddenly fairly faded into the background. That's the norm around me. The fact that I strongly and consciously identify as a European becomes a major political statement, particularly in the current climate. Um, but we also find that mixed and non-majority identities in the Middle Ages were not a simple power barrier. Um, as I mentioned, the so you have prominent families who get into significant positions because of their connections into their own ethnic groups and uh, because the monarchs often needed somebody who could exercise that connection. Um, this doesn't mean that this was some like happy clappy, you know, modern, this is the future the liberals want system. These minority ethnic groups often had specific expectations or obligations. Uh, in particular, the Kipchak population in Georgia had very significant burdens of military service, and they were invited into Georgia en masse in the 1120s for that explicit reason. But precisely because the Kipchaks were here, you know, to provide a large mounted fighting arm for the Georgian army, Having a good connection with the Kipchaks as a Georgian ruler was really quite important. Uh, and we have multiple records of significant problems happening with Georgian military campaigns if that broke down. Um, I'll move on to touch on gender briefly because it's also a sort of important aspect here for identity. Women did hold significant power in medieval Georgia, most notably Mepe Tama. Mepe here is the title, it's, it is king or queen, it's a non gendered uh, term for a monarch. Tamar is sometimes seen as unique in Georgian history, but this tends to miss the kind of inarticulate parts of power. Women didn't tend to hold formal offices in this period, but they did hold very important roles. And here again, we get back to connectivity, brokerage, uh, control by a connection. And they had a number of diplomatic and negotiation-based roles. I also see that I'm running short on time. I apologize for that. Um, so to rethink identity in games, uh, we can say that maybe the sole focus on violence in the state can sometimes restrict the agency of characters with oppressed identities by distancing them, by leaving them simply as people to whom violence happens. And those stories are important to tell at times, but by portraying different societies, we can build a more diverse range of characters and meaningfully approach social dynamics without approaching our own issues as being entirely immutable. Um, and we can do this by looking at how elites reach towards minority groups out of self-interest and look at how characters with minority or oppressed identities can gain power through brokerage systems. I'm going to run through this as quickly as I can, but I think there are ways we can do this mechanically. So encoding social networks and characters in games uh, to build sort of more simulation driven quest design around some of these features, I think could allow us to engage with those mechanics of brokerage. Um, and those simulations could also be applied to identities to tag different identity traits and allow situational simulations of, as I mentioned, when does a particular form of identity come to the forefront? 
Um, there are problems with this approach, particularly the way that you can end up multiplying up the amount of work you need to do in the game or making things too generic. Um, but nonetheless, I think this is an important approach that developers could take to address some of these problems and better represent some of these medieval societies. So a final quick run over. Games curate history. What goes in and what stays out is a question we should be asking when looking at medieval ideas and power in games. When we look at different historical societies, though, particularly ones outside the Western European medieval that becomes the quote unquote norm for that time period, we can get a different viewpoint, different ways of imagining social roles and how they might function, different ways that politics and society might work without the full structures of the modern state. And that can bring us benefits for game design and for representation um, by opening up new stories and engagements for players by stopping modern power dynamics becoming a simple inevitability in a game world setting, and while still allowing us to explore identity and power issues in meaningful ways. And simulating social mechanics, I think, are one possible way to explore this. Um, and having taken you between Vardzir and Valerio, uh, that is Didi Madlova, Jordan, for thank you. Uh, and thank you for listening, everyone.